Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Sunday School on this beautiful day. Um, I wanted to do this lesson as I read through it. <clears throat> it kind of goes into a lot of what I was talking about, what I've been talking about, or at least trying to talk about, trying to convey. Um, but I don't know if I can follow up Charlie, and then David's going to be next week, and I know I'm nowhere near as good as David. So just bear with me for the next hour and a half, and then uh, we will get through this. But we have a praise, William Benton was born on at 432 yesterday morning at 8 pounds, 13 ounces, and 21 inches. So baby and mama are doing great. Grandparents are doing great. Uh, they're going to stay home and watch online because they want to be around the kid and help the kid out. So they're going to, or help uh, Will and uh, Anna Benton out. So they're going to uh, isolate themselves so they can be there to help with the newborn and love on their grandkid. Um, please pray for Whitney as she woke up not feeling good. Austin is taking her to the doctor this morning. So please be in, just a precaution, but please be in prayer uh, for Whitney. Also pray for Nicole as she is not feeling so hot today either, so she will not be here. Um, is there any other prayer requests? No other prayer requests? Yeah, Joel, he's sitting out in the car, isn't he? Oh, he just dropped you off. Coming back. cards on the desk. I bring it in on the Sunday, so I'm glad you brought it up. Always pray for Gail Welch. I got it. That's awesome. But that's great news. Thank you. Yes, continue to, uh, Joel, I didn't mean to pass over that one, but he's going to be having a, he's got to go to his heart doctor again, uh, so just keep praying for him as he's going through, uh, I mean, whatever issues going on, that's what they're trying to figure out right now. So, uh, keep praying for Joel. Yes, little Wade. Little Wade came out of his surgery uh, fine, uh, but I can't imagine the pain that he is in right now. So be, be with Wade, you know, pray for, pray for healing for Wade and then peace for the family that, you know, that Sydney and them are there having to take care of him because it's tough when it's your kid. So as all of you know. Any others? Okay, will do. Thank you for being here, though. All right, if there's none other, I will uh, open us up in prayer, and then we'll get into the uh, <clears throat> Sunday school lesson. Father God, we come to you with all these different prayer requests, all these different needs, God. And you know each and every one of those needs better than anyone in here. So God, we just call upon you to heal, to provide peace, to provide comfort, to give answers where answers are needed. And God, we pray for those that are dealing with, with sickness and illness. God, also give them peace and comfort. Give them the, the peace that surpasses all understanding. God, and whatever happens in each and every one of these situations, that it is to your glory. And we know ultimately that your will will be done. And God, we just thank you for, for allowing us to come together and worship. And I just pray that you be with us this morning as we go through the Sunday school lesson, God, and that we pull out what you want us to pull out. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning we are back in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, and we're going to be going from 13 all the way through to, i got to make sure I got this right, all the way through verse 24 through 25. So we're going to be 1 Peter 13 through uh, 25. So one of the, one of the questions that's, that's in the book, it says, uh, when have you been fooled by something that didn't live up to its claims? I mean, how many of you in here have ever bought anything based off an infomercial? I'll raise my hand because I've done that. I was, uh, I'm not a big country music fan. I don't know why I did this. But I was up all night in the dispatch center at the fire department, and there was this infomercial about all the old, old school. I'm talking about the black and white TV time, maybe no TV time, and you could get the whole box set for like 60-something bucks. I bought it. 
You think I ever opened that CD? I don't know why that guy convinced me that night. I know I was tired. But it didn't live up to the hype because I don't listen to a lot of country music anyway. But how many, I mean, how many of you have ever been fooled by something that doesn't live up to the hype? Maybe a church service, right? Maybe a preacher. Maybe a family member. You find something out about somebody that you, you would have never thought they would be capable of. But I think we all have, have been fooled by something that didn't live up to its claims. Um, unfortunately, many times, that's why marriages implode and that's why they end. Because when you're in that love stage, that puppy love stage, everything's great, right? And then you get married, you move in together, and you find some things out you just didn't know when you were dating. And sometimes that's a little bit tough for some folks. But our, our, our point is our hope in Christ changes how we view the world and live in it. See, we are a people of hope. Everything that we look at needs to come from a place of hope, not from a place of despair. The saying, he who dies with the most toys wins, aptly describes how many people live in today's culture, whether it's a bigger house, <clears throat> a better job, or getting our children into a certain school. People chase after things of this world. Faith and hope in Christ transforms our perspectives. It places Christ at the center of our lives so that the life is no longer about what we can gain, but about how we love and serve God and others. You know, we call it keeping up with the Joneses. You know, my neighborhood, everybody in my neighborhood has a golf cart. Everybody in my neighborhood has a golf cart. Guess who doesn't? Guess who wants one? Why? What do I need a golf cart for? I can just walk. But it's, everybody's got a golf cart. It's like the cool thing to do, right? But, you know, I instead of looking at it as like something I don't have, be thankful for what I do have. But see, we're supposed to be, if, if Christ is the center of our lives, then our life is no longer about what we can buy, what we can gain, what we can get, who we can look better than. Who, who, you know, my truck is bigger than yours, my boat is nicer than yours. It's no longer about that. It's about how we love and serve God and others. So when we read 1 Peter, we, 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 what we do know is that Peter most likely wrote this in the early 60 ADs, uh, and he was probably living in what is common uh, today, Turkey, known as Turkey, the, the country of Turkey. Uh, these Christians were facing various trials, as with any Christians under the Roman Empire, a lot of persecution. Um, but he encouraged them to remain faithful to Christ. Then Peter went on to instruct them on how they should demonstrate their confident hope on a daily basis. So we're going to pick it up in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Wherefore, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So one of the key words in this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now understand, and we've talked about this many, many times, when we talk about uh, the second coming, we know that it's going to be soon, right? But understand it was soon in Acts 1.8. So the, the, the focus of, of our church should not just be about Jesus' second coming. And we're looking forward to that, unless death takes us first. We're looking forward to that, but that, that's not supposed to be our, our focus, but it, but it is, it does give us that hope for the future because we know who wins. Because remember, this is all about hope. So see, uh, in verse 13, it talks about God does not save us so that we can continue to live according to our previous values and priorities. As soon as we become uh, children of God, our focus should then be on how to glorify God. Not, to how, not how to glorify us, not how to, to, to be, you know, the, the, the richest guy in town or the richest gal in town or have the nicest cars. It's supposed to be focused on godly things. Now, <clears throat> one of my vices, and I, I, I don't know if it's a sin or not, but I like Bibles. I have so many Bibles, and every time I go into a Christian bookstore, I walk out with a new Bible, and Felicia about kills me. Um, I don't know if that falls into that. Like, maybe I should just stick with one and read it and use it. And, but I, I constantly want Bibles. And if I see somebody else has a nice Bible, I want that Bible too. So then I'm going to go to the store and find that Bible. But that's just one of, one of my vices. But God saves us so that we can reveal his glorious truth through our redeemed and transformed lives. I mean, if you think about it, what a powerful testimony. When the town drunk 
maybe a drug addict that you knew, maybe a drug addict that stole from you comes to know Jesus and turns their life around. I mean, how many of you have known folks like that? I mean, I have read stories about gang members in L.A., especially during these times, that have come to know Christ and their ministry is to the gangs and what they've been able to do inside the gangs during this time to bring them together. Now, do you think somebody like me or one of you could have walked into downtown L.A. and done that just because we were Christians? I mean, sure, God can do anything. Please trust me, I know that. But do, do you think that would be prudent for one of us to walk down there? So it's because those individuals accepted Jesus and their priorities changed. Their priorities changed from what they could have here on this earth to what was up in heaven. And they shared that with their fellow gang members, which they're no longer gang members, they were. So Peter has challenged his readers to endure their trials because of their new birth into a living hope. But Peter moved on, uh, wherefore, to encourage them to rely fully on that hope as a direction and motivation for how to live. See, these Christians had already received salvation through their faith in Jesus Christ because we know that it is by faith, by God's grace, uh, which we are saved, not of works, right? Everybody knows that scripture. However, there is more grace and more blessing to come at the revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns to the earth at his second coming. Um, Peter stressed that until Jesus returns, believers should live in a way that reflects their confidence in their living hope. I mean, that makes sense, right? If you're saved, you know Jesus is either going to come back or you're going to die and be with him in heaven. Either way, you're going to be in heaven. Shouldn't we live that way? Shouldn't we live that way? But, but here's what happens, especially in the type of church I gr grew up in. It was almost like a get out of hell free card. I mean, that's, we were more afraid of hell then we loved Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Because that's all you screamed about, was hell. I mean, they, they, they made a movie called The Burning Hell. It's an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing uh, production company back in the 60s, I think, made this movie. My pastor, matter of fact, him and his family were in the movie. And so we'd watch that about once a year. But all, it was a scare tactic. It was like watching a scary movie. So, of course, what young kid that is watching this and seeing what potentially could happen if they don't get saved is not going to come forward because it was out of fear, not out of love. There was zero love in that movie. It was all about hell and why you don't want to go to hell. So it's important that we live out of love. It's important, Peter is, is saying, you know how this is going to end. When you got saved, you need to make sure your focus is on that, not on this. Not on this. You know, we gotta, the first thing we got to do is we got we to gotta steal our minds. We got to protect our minds. Because what's up here normally comes out here. And I, I'm guilty of that too. To gird up the loins is referred to getting ready for battle or for hard work. The warrior or worker should pull up his long outer garment and tuck it into his belt or girdle so it would not limit the freedom of his legs to move. The concept of girding up the loins was often used literally in the Old Testament but only in a figurative sense in the New Testament. So how is a Christian to ready his or her mind for a battle in the service of Christ? First, we need to put aside any thoughts that distract us. How many of us have thoughts that distract us? <laughs> right? Just this morning, I got two texts that distracted me. You know, so we, we always have things that distract us. I mean, it's almost as soon as you get up out of bed, all of a sudden your brain starts going into overdrive. Everything you got to do that day, maybe that week, if it's a Monday, uh, you know, th there's no rest. But we're distracted constantly. And what else helps us be distracted now? Technology, right? It's easy for me to look on here and say, ooh, and get upset about something that, you know, somebody posted on, on Facebook or something I read in the news because I'll get a news alert. But we're constantly distracted. And see, Peter is telling us we don't need to be distracted. We need to be focused on God. We need to know what we believe about God's truth and how we should act in the light of it. See, a lot of Christians don't understand why they're Christians, honestly. Somebody sat them down. Somebody said, hey, this is, you know, what I, this is how I live my life. I'd love if you, could, if you could be saved or maybe you got saved in church. But a lot of Christians do not know why they are Christians think about it because the the church is the only organization that i know of in america 
that takes somebody who's a brand new baby in, in faith and then throws them to the wolves. You're saved, now go out and do God's work. Well, what exactly does that look like? You know, that's, that's, that's where that discipleship comes in. That discipleship comes in. But we need to know what we believe. And we need to be able to defend it. I encourage everybody, if you've never seen Ravi Zacharias, um, he's a, a Christian apologetic, the, uh, apologetic that just died, passed away. Um, it's amazing to hear him speak and how he breaks down. And I mean, he goes toe-to-toe with atheists, agnostic, Muslim. I mean, he goes toe-to-toe, and, it, and it's not ugly. It's not like the knockdown drag out. They get their chance to speak, and then he gets up and defends the Christian faith. That's what we should be able to do. That's what we should be able to do intelligently. But, I, I mean, I've been caught flat-footed before. I've been caught flat-footed before. But we're supposed to believe about, uh, we're supposed to know what we believe about God's truth and how we should act in light of it. I mean, I, you know, I've seen people, and I, I had a buddy, he was a bishop in his Mormon church, and at work, you couldn't tell. At work, you couldn't tell. But then when I'd go to help him do something uh, off-duty, build something for a friend or something who also was in a Mormon church, he would tell me, hey, you can't bring any of this stuff up. I'm a, I think he was a bishop, or I don't know what they call him. But he was pretty high up in, in, in the Mormon church. But you wouldn't be able to tell at work. You wouldn't be able to tell at work. And I've, I've been guilty of that as well. But we're supposed to know how to act in light of it. You know, if we're tailgating the person in front of us because they're going too slow, is that acting Christ-like, especially if we tailgate them all the way up to this road and then turn in and park in front of the church. Maybe they pull into and park in front of the church. I've been guilty of that. You know, we're supposed to act like we have hope. We're supposed to act like we are Christians. Um, Hope will not become a reality without disciplined thinking. Thinking in a new way does not happen automatically. It requires effort, concentration, and intentionality. Everything that a Christian does should be intentional. Should be intentional. We should deny ourselves daily, intentionally. I mean, sure, we can wake up and say it. Sure, we can wake up and say a prayer. But then if your sin is, you know, maybe you drink too much alcohol, and then you go and drink alcohol, even though that morning you said, there's no intentionality behind it. The actions have to be behind what you're saying you're going to do. You know, it, it, maybe if your sin is just slandering people, gossiping, I mean, there's so many of them. Mine's gluttony right now, it seems. But if there's no intentionality behind not doing that, then it's just mere words. It's just mere words. So we have to concentrate on it. We have to know where our weaknesses are. We have to know that if we're, we don't like getting up early, but that's the only time we can read the Bible, guess what we got to do? We got to get up early and we got to read the Bible. We have to concentrate we have to be intentional. Without that, we're just going to be a bunch of shells. No fruit. Walking around. Uh, we also need to always be sober. Now, of course, a lot of people, when they think sober, it, it's, you know, don't be drunk. But what they're talking about here is the sober is you're balanced. You, you, you're alert to what's going on. And you're balanced in what you do. It, it's not talking about uh, uh, drinking alcohol. That, just using that Uh, term be sober. Um, The term also translates a single Greek word, nepho, whose literal meaning is the opposite of being drunk. However, the term can also have a figurative sense, as is the case here. Someone who is well balanced, uh, someone who is sober, excuse me, is well balanced and self-controlled. They were more careful to stay grounded in the truth they had learned from the apostles. See, that's, that's how we get grounded in the truth, right? That's where getting up early in the morning, even though we don't like it, and reading our Bible keeps us grounded in the truth. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. You know, if you come up here and, and, you, and you become saved and you accept Jesus as your, as your Savior and you don't uh, create good habits like reading your Bible and praying and trying not to do the things that you know are against what God wants you to do, then you're not, you're, you're not going to know what God wants you to do though, right? If you're not reading your Bible. If you're not get digging into his word. Furthermore, they would not allow, and we're talking about uh, the, the folks in uh, 1 Peter, they were, they were not to allow the things of this present world to take precedence over their loyalty to Christ. By staying alert and self-controlled, the believers should, would be able to stay focused on their living hope. You know, 
I'm just going to be real, but when I read that, I think about politics today. Politics today. How many Christians are fighting because one's a Democrat and one's a Republican? And what's crazy is if you're a Republican, you're like, how can you be a Democrat because they're for abortion? But then if they're a Democrat, they're like, well, how can you be for Republican because they're not about helping the least of these, right? They think Republicans are all about making money for themselves. Now, the podium should never be, the pulpit should never be about politics. Politics should never be brought into it. I'm bringing that up as an example because I think too many people are loyal, more loyal to politics and what's going on than they are to Jesus Christ. We know how this ends. Everybody understands we have zero control how this ends, right? We have zero control how this ends. But by all means, vote. By all means, do your thing. But don't get so wrapped up in it that it's affecting who you are and how you act. Because we believe in something that's bigger than politics. We believe in something that's bigger than laws that are made on this earth. And when the time comes and there's laws made that that go against our Christian faith, we will stand up and defy them. Because that's what we're told to do. But until then, we'll render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But we need to maintain our loyalty to Christ more than anything that's on this earth. More than anything that's on this earth. So, um, verse 14 now. The imperative in this next thought is uh, uh, verse 15. Be holy in all manner of conversation. However, uh, Peter first described the contrast between those who had received a new birth in a living hope with those who had not. Because of their new birth, their radical transformation from being lost to being saved, from spiritual to death life, these believers were now children of God. So what's one of the primary expectations of parents for their children? What do you expect out of your child? Which is kind of funny, ironic, um, we expect obedience, right? So me, I get so frustrated with my kid after I tell them for the 50th time to do something and they don't do it. Or they're out in the backyard and they like to take popsicles out there because it's hot and then I go out back and I got popsicles because they don't just eat one, right? If you're not paying attention. So I got popsicle litter all over my backyard. But then I think about how many times I disobey God. If God punished me like I punished my kids, I wouldn't be able to walk. I wouldn't be able to walk. So when you think of it from that aspect, you know, as parents, we expect obedience from our kids. Why are we not obedient to God? He is our Father that is in heaven. See, God the Father expects a regular pattern of obedience to his will a will and word from his children. Peter then reminded his readers of the condition of their lives before they put their faith in Jesus. They had existed in a state of ignorance. In this former condition, they had allowed themselves to be conformed to former lusts of their fallen human nature. Since Jesus had set them free from slavery to sin, these Christians were not to return to the lifestyle of conforming to the world's values and focusing on sinful appetites. Now, did that mean that they never sinned? There was only one perfect person on this earth. But that's what, you know, we are are supposed to do. We are supposed to not conform to this world because prior to becoming saved, that's what we were. We were just another pawn on, on on the playing field of the devil. We were conformed to this world. We, we, we believed everything that was told to us by the news. We believed everything that was told to us by our buddies. We stayed in constant drama. And maybe not all of you. But we're not to be conformed to this world. We are set apart. And that's what Peter is is telling his folks there. He reminds them, remember who you were before you got saved. See, as Christians, I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we actually sit down and think about how horrible a human being we still are even though we're saved. But how horrible and, and, and how much more we deserve death and hell prior to getting to know Jesus, prior to getting, starting a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because I truly believe if we took more time to sit down and think about that, that fire and that passion, that love that we're supposed to share, would be more on the forefront instead of getting comfortable. Instead of saying, oh, I'm saved, this is my church, this is my seat, this is my pew, this is my, as long as, if they come in, we'll love them, but I'm not gonna go out there and love them. 
Now, I get it. Some of you were saved in this church, but tell me, how many of you weren't saved in a church? What if they, the person that talked to you about salvation and brought you to Jesus Christ had those same thoughts and beliefs and feelings? You wouldn't be sitting here. So it's important that we focus on, on what is important. It's important that we focus on what's important. There you go. That's the bottom line. All right, everybody take that down. That's a noteworthy. But we, rem- we need to remain focused and understand that we are not to give in to our sin appetites. We are to focus on what God wants us to do. So then in verse 15 and 16, it says, In contrast to their former way of life, Peter urged his readers to be ye holy in all they said and did. Um, Originally, the word holy indicated something or someone that had been set apart for service to God. Jerusalem was called the holy city because the temple was located there. Zechariah referred to God's holy prophets whom God had set apart to be his messengers. The opposite of holy is something common, ordinary, or profane. Of course, only God is completely, perfectly holy. But if we are set apart, we are holy through his blood. We are holy. We have been sanctified. First we were justified, or we were sanctified, then we're justified. Or it could be justified and sanctified. But we, we are holy only because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We are not holy in and of ourselves. And we know that because it says there are none righteous, no, not one, right? Only Jesus Christ. And you can translate that to good. I love the question, why do good things happen to, or bad things happen to good people? Well, there's only one good person ever walked this earth and he died on a cross. So when things happen to us, it's not because we're good people. It's not because we're good people and somebody's trying to get at us. But um, his messengers, the opposite of holy is something common, ordinary, or profane. Of course, only God is completely and perfectly holy. Peter reminded his readers of God's command in Leviticus, be ye holy for I am holy. It's Leviticus eleven forty four through 45. God had called the nation of Israel to be his special people and to live according to his covenant with them. As his people, they were to be different from all other nations. So, if in the Old Testament, the the Israelites, the Jews, they were God's chosen, then in the New Testament we see with Paul, he opens it up to the Gentiles, right? So, if if we are, um, if, if we are special enough for God to open up his covenant and to accept the Gentiles, and the Jews, then why wouldn't we want to be different? Why wouldn't we want to be different? Why wouldn't we want to scream? Why wouldn't we want our lives to scream out that I am a saved Christian? I believe in a higher power. I know my life may not be okay right now, but I know who's in control of my life. Why wouldn't we want to say that? Because what do we see out here in this world? We just see a lot of despair, a lot of muck and mire. People can't get out of it. So what do they do? They go to drugs. They kill themselves. I mean, as Christians, none of that stuff should even be on our minds, right? We should be proud of of, of the, the fact that God opened up his salvation and sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die on the cross for Jews and Gentiles. We are special. We should act like it. And I'm not talking about window looking special where you ride the short bus with the helmet. No, all right, maybe that's a joke when I was in school. But they were be holy, unique in the way they worshiped and lived. God also called Jesus' disciples to be holy. Believers are to be different from the non-believers around them in their thoughts, words, and actions. Peter used these believers to make sure their lives reflected God's holy nature. Because see, remember, uh, when you become a Christian, you're taking Jesus with you everywhere that you go. You know, in the military, when you were in uniform and you went off base and, you know, you got your name right on your chest, you got your rank, you, you were specifically told, don't do anything stupid because they know where you work and they know who you are or whose you are, who you belong to. Well, as a Christian, it's the same thing. When you're out in, this t- in, in town, when you're out in Florence or when you're out in uh, Columbia or wherever you're at, if you're acting a fool... Do you think people would want to have what you have? Do you think people would want to come to you and say, hey, I I really like the way you're acting. You must be a Christian. Can Can you tell me more about it? Or do you want to be set apart and do you want to be that example? So people are like, man, my life is a mess. And I know you went through some of the same stuff. Or I know you're going through some of the same stuff. 
How are, you, how are you so peaceful? How are you so calm? Why are you so happy? Instead of going out and having our lives reflect that we are Christians inside the building and then we act like the world outside. That's not what we're called to do. So then in 1 Peter 17 through 21, it says, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So our calling to live as, as God's people is clear. It, it, it can't get any clearer than that. The two realities give us special motivation to honor our calling, our reverence for God as judge and our gratitude for God's grace and the price Jesus paid for our redemption. We also read that Peter continued to call his readers to live holy lifestyles, reminding them of who they were in relation to God. They were sojourning here on earth. Everybody understands what a sojourner is, right? You just kind of go with the wind. You just go wherever. You're just constantly moving. There's no stability. There's no stability. So um, they were sojourners on the earth. Our lively hope enables believers to look at all of life in terms of eternity. Our true citizenship is not of this world, but in heaven, which we read in uh, Philippians 3.20. Our conduct in this life should reflect this reality. Again, been saying it from the beginning, right? Uh, so if you haven't noticed, the central theme of this is uh, our, our lives should reflect who we are. Our lives should reflect whose we are. Our lives should reflect the fact that we are Christians, that we are Christians. Now, I, I once again, because I think a lot of times, I know a lot of times, because I grew up in this, people think you can't have money or nice things and not be a Christian. That is false. That is false. You can be rich. You can have nice things as long as they don't control you. As long as you're still doing what God wants you to do with your resources, with your time. But our conduct in this life should reflect this reality. Another incentive for holy conduct is that God is our holy and righteous Father, who without respect of persons judge according to every man's work. So I, I don't care who you are, from the president all the way down to the lowest of the low, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See, I know our world is made up of different levels, right? You got, you got poor, you got middle class, upper middle class, and then rich or whatever they got out there now. But, but here's the beauty of our Lord and Savior. We are all the same in his eyes. We are all going to face the same judgment. We're all going to face the same judgment. See, as Christians, we have the right to call on him as uh, our father because uh, we are his children. However, we must remember that he holds us accountable for our conduct. Therefore, we should always think, speak, and act in fear toward him. And so this fear, once again, please remember that this fear is not one of trembling. This fear is not one of, uh, you know, if, you, if you're raised with a strict father like I was, of wait till your dad gets home and the belt comes out, right? That's not the fear that, that, uh, that we're talking about in the Bible. The fear that we're talking about is you respect. It's all about respect. It's all about obedience. It's all about respect and obedience. Knowing that you could never take his place. Knowing that, that we are, are, are way lower than, than him, right? Because we go to him for our salvation. So the fear, understand, is not one of trembling. The fear is not one of, uh, what is he going to do to me because I did this? That is not a fear. That is not a fear. So let me assure you, the next time something bad happens to you, it's not because of something that you have done. It's just a consequence of living in a broken world. Of course, I'm not going to go down a rabbit trail, but if you smoke cigarettes your whole life and then you get cancer, that's a byproduct of smoking a cigarette. You obviously were actively partaking in it. I'm saying if something bad happens to you unexpectedly, it's not because of something you have done to deserve it. You are a sinful nature. You live in a broken world. 
Sometimes it just happens. So <clears throat> this does not mean that we should fear God, but have a healthy respect to both his love and his sovereignty. While we enjoy his grace, we also must keep in mind that he is holy and righteous. He is going to judge us according to our conduct. The Father's grace, Jesus has paid our debt of all of our sins. However, our Heavenly Father still holds his children accountable for their actions in terms of what we have done with his gift of salvation in Christ. How have we lived in the light of our new life in Christ? I don't know about any of you all, but I do not want to stand in front of Jesus and say, I never shared the gospel, I'm sorry. I don't want to stand in front of Jesus and say, I had all this money in the bank and I never helped a single person. I don't want to stand in front of Jesus and say, I know you loved me enough to die on that cross, but I didn't love very well. I don't want to be that person. So we need to live the light of our new life in Christ or of our life in Christ. See, the Gentile believers' former way of life before Christ was vain. It was empty, right? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's a, it's a mist, it's a vapor. It was vain, it was empty. With no escape from their sinful past, no peace for the present, and no hope for the future. They were totally ignorant of the true God and his truth. Their situation was a result of the belief system they had received by tradition from their ancestors, which would have been the scribes and the Pharisees uh, that believed in the, in the Mosaic laws, in the, in the Old Covenant. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ. So, I mean, you know, this was beaten to their head. So they, they thought they were doing what was right. I mean, how many of us have, have done that before? And then looking back, you're like, ooh, that probably wasn't, maybe it wasn't a sin, but it just wasn't the right way to do it, even though you felt at the time or you were told at the time that it was the right way to do it. Right? We all, we all have that. He had called and blessed the people of Israel through his covenant with them. However, both Gentile and Jews were enslaved. The Gentiles to their many false gods and hedonistic lifestyles, and the Jews to their trust in keeping the law as the way to God. Both groups needed to be redeemed and free of their bondage to sin by the payment of a ransom. An enormous price was required for their freedom. It was not to be paid with corruptible things as silver and gold. The price was much higher and the reward infinitely greater. Infinitely greater. So, of course, verse 19, the only sufficient payment for the sin was the precious blood of Jesus Christ, right? The only perfect man to ever walk the earth. The only perfect human being to ever walk the earth. Now, everybody knows he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Right after he was baptized. The scribes and the Pharisees constantly tried to corner him. So there was opportunity. Jesus was being tested. There was opportunity for him to sin. But he knew no sin. He knew no sin. So it had to be that Jesus came down and died. That was the only sufficient payment for our sin. It had to be a perfect lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. The image of the blood sacrifice goes back to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament covenant. However, this system was inadequate as a permanent solution for guilt and slavery brought by, brought by sin. Through the prophet Isaiah, God revealed that one day he would establish a new covenant. God would send his servant who would suffer in our place like a lamb without blemish and without spot. God would make his soul an offering for sin. Jesus once, was once offered to bear the sins of many, according to Hebrews 9.28. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and told his followers, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So, we see, and as I've read, we know that it took a perfect sacrifice, right? The old ways of, of sacrificing animals and doing a certain, I mean, I'm sure you all have read Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy, and I mean, it was down to the, to the T about how someone became, you know, cleansed again or how somebody could join the, the, the tribe again. Because if you were dirty, you would, you'd be put outside the city for a little bit. And then the, the, Levi the Levitical priests would go in and do the sacrifice, and then once you were cleansed, you were able to come back in. Could you imagine living like that now? I mean, we struggle, we struggle with just following simple laws, like not speeding, that's me. Could you imagine having to, well, you know, we're supposed to sacrifice, you know, a bull on this day at this time, and it's got to be a certain way, and only certain people can come in? I mean, what kind of, what kind of Christianity is that? I mean, just think about it. 
How, how would that be in our new times? In our new times. You know, Jade have to bring like 10 chickens, you know, every, once a month to be sacrificed to appease God. I mean, it, that, that, to me, it's just crazy to think because it was never put in place to save anyone. I, I want us to understand that. The Mosaic laws were never about saving anyone. It was about making them worthy. It was about making them worthy. Salvation did not come along until Jesus Christ died on the cross. Until Jesus Christ died on the cross. <clears throat> so, um, verse 20, Peter went to describe Jesus as the one who was foreordained before the foundation of the world. The term foreordained probably refers to both God's purpose and Christ's preexistence. In the beginning of his gospel, John wrote of Jesus' preexistence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So that's John chapter 1, 1 through 3. See, regarding the purpose before God created the universe, he knew that sinful humanity would need a Savior. He also knew that Jesus, the Son of God, through whom all things were made, would be the Savior of the world. See, God is all-knowing. You read a lot in the Scripture about foreordained, elect, and there's all sorts of conversations we have about that. But if you have an all-knowing God, of course everything is foreordained. He already knew it. He already knew what was going to happen. So um, <clears throat> the foreordination of, of Jesus, we, he, we need, God knew, I'll spit it out, that he was the Savior of the world. While Jesus is eternally God as much as the Father and the Holy Spirit, God the Father did not reveal Jesus to the world until the time was right for his plan of redemption. Many Old Testament prophecies pointed towards Jesus. However, Jesus was not manifest until the time of his incarnation, when Mary conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to Jesus. It was John the Baptist who pointed out Jesus' true identity at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministries. So as Christians, sometimes we talk about the last days in reference to the events described in the book of Revelations. However, the New Testament understanding of these last times, which could also be translated end of the ages, is that the last days began with Jesus' birth, ministry and death on the cross, and will continue until Christ's second coming. And see, in verse 21, what Peter is talking about is that uh, Jesus' true glory was revealed after his resurrection. Because if you remember... Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples, right? Everybody remembers that. And you remember, uh, I believe it was Peter that said, no, let me wash your feet. Because Jesus was trying to show him what sacrificial leadership looked like. J Jesus was trying to show them that what was getting ready to come was gonna be a lot bigger than me washing your feet, but I am here to serve. I am here to save. And even right up until his death, the disciples didn't understand that. They didn't understand it. It didn't matter how many times, how many times he tell them, I got to die. And they're like, ah, you, you don't, you don't got to die. Wasn't it Peter that cut the guy's ear off? When he, I mean, so if you think about it, they didn't even believe that his death was coming, that he, that he, was, that he was going to die to save the world. Now they believed that he was the son of God. Do not get me wrong. But there was still not a lot of understanding. I'll put it that way. There was not a lot of understanding of who Jesus was, even by those closest to him. Even by those closest closest to him so peter noted that god raised jesus up from the dead peter often spoke about how god the father gave glory to jesus through the resurrection as peter and other christians shared the good news about jesus and his resurrection the ones to whom peter was writing had put their faith in jesus as their savior and lord the reality of the resurrection is also the reason believers trust god the father is the only one who offers real living hope because if you think about it how many other gods, lowercase g, how many other denominations who believe in something other than Jesus are still alive in their writings? Muhammad's dead. Buddha's dead. Jesus Christ is the only true God, but he's the only uh, higher power that is still alive. No matter what religion you look at, read them all. There's only one. There's only one, and that's Christianity that believes in a God who is still alive, Jesus Christ, uh, through Jesus Christ. So what time is it, Charlie? Because I could talk all day. Ooh. All right. You know what? Here's what we'll do. We'll end it there, and I'll finish this up tonight. So that way we can get ready, because I still got a sermon I got to get.
get, make sure I got ready for. Some of you are probably tired and want to go to the bathroom. So we'll finish up tonight with uh, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. And then that way uh, David can do next week's message or uh, Sunday school lesson. And we'll be on track. So uh, I hope that was a, a blessing. I, I really enjoy this type of stuff. It, I've talked to Charlie before. I'm, I'm not a big fan of manuscript type, which is what this is. Um, because I don't want to miss anything, even when I sit down and type stuff out. Like, I have to, I got to read it, because obviously if I typed it, it's good. Um, but I do try to interject some things that I, that I feel the Lord has laid on my heart. So I hope it was a blessing to you. We'll finish it up tonight, uh, the last few verses at our Sunday evening uh, worship service. So uh, any, any last-minute prayer requests before we close in prayer? All right, Alex, you mind closing some prayer, sir? Amen. Thank you.